Well, good afternoon. Just when I thought I had it figured out, Lund comes again. You know, every year I go through the same thing. I, I'm all prepared. I've got Lent on the horizon. I start making my preparations. I think I've got it ready. And then Lent throws me lots and lots of surprises. And every year has been kind of the same. Recall a couple of weeks ago, we started this Lenten journey where we were going to examine how we tend to think we've got it figured out. And there was Jesus out in the desert, and the key line that I hope you still have ringing in your head, which matches up and leads us to today's gospel, which to me is the epitome of our message for Lent, Jesus was hungry. That line, he was hungry and didn't give in to temptation. We always think we have it figured out, so we're going to give up things for Lent. We're going to do things for Lent, and off we go, picking these things that are, well, not so hard to do. Let's face it. Someone once said to me, you know, I'm going to give up soda for Lent. I said, oh, you drink a lot of soda? No. Well, it makes it a lot easier to give up, I guess, doesn't it? Then we had good old St. Peter, thought he had it, had it all together. Lord, we're here. You're transfigured. I can make some money on this, Lord. Can we stay here and build some booths so that when the pilgrimages start, we can make all sorts of money? And then the voice spoke, and Peter was overwhelmed with fear. Again, going to extremes. Last week was a pretty different kind of a gospel. There you had these people trying to ask Jesus, you know, hey, listen, there were these people who died horrendously. Were they greater sinners than we were? Jesus reminds them, sin is sin. If you're a sinner, you're a sinner. If you don't change, then nothing changes. If you don't make changes. Like when we come into Lent every year, have we really changed anything? So many of us already have a busy life, and what do we do when we enter Lent? We try to add something on to that busyness. And what's usually getting cut from the schedule? What we added on. And I think that's why so many times we had it figured out, and then it's all falling apart. Now here we are on the fourth Sunday of Lent. We're coming together now, and this is one of those weekends where we get to rejoice a little bit. We get to inflict a little bit of joy into our, our penances. Today especially, we rejoice. Now I know every one of you sitting here, I'm sure you love a good conversion story. I mean, you look at the Pentecostals. The Pentecostals Whenever they have a big service, they love to have someone who has gone through a radical, huge conversion. They love to bring that person out. They love to have that person stand in front of everybody and do that, that same speech that we've heard a few times in our lives. I was lost. I was so deep in my sin. I was such a horrible person. I was an alcoholic. I was a drug addict. I was hooked on this. I was doing all of these things. You name it. Then I encountered Christ, and everything was different. And now I stand before you bearing fruit for God. It's a great story, isn't it? And you can fit a lot of different personalities in it, and it almost seems sometimes like the Pentecostals have the corner of the market for conversion stories. But they don't. They really don't. There are so many who come to the Catholic Church that come for a variety of reasons. There are two types of stories that I've encountered in my day. There's the true conversion story where someone was away and comes to the Catholic faith, or what I like to call the reversion story, the person born Catholic who finally has an encounter with Christ and their whole life has changed. You can see any of them by just checking different things. Two of my favorite conversion or well, reversion stories, one of them is Father Donald Calloway. If you've never heard his story, you can Google it very simply. He was one that was completely lost and is now a priest promoting Joseph, St. Joseph and devotion to St. Joseph. If you haven't heard about Father Donald Calloway, look it up. A great reversion story that can inspire you and it can inspire, inspire me. Or another great conversion story that we have, Dr. Scott Hahn, who was converted because he slipped into a Catholic Mass and realize we Catholics weren't such terrible pe pe people. Here's this Baptist that's sitting there going, wow, there's a lot of scripture going on at this Mass. Hmm, that's strange. And the more he prayed about it, the more he was drawn, and now has become, I think, one of the most proficient and prolific speakers on the Catholic faith. 
tremendous, tremendous. This past week, however, those of, who are participating in the 99 saw this woman, Leah Darrow, back in 2004, 2005. She was a beautiful woman modeling. And she was actually modeling and taking, getting all these pictures and everything when she has a vision of her standing before God with empty hands. Just standing before God with empty hands. She had nothing to give because she hadn't lived her life. And here's the word, I created you for something more. And just walked off the set and has become one of the most, I would say, important Catholic speakers we have today, speaking about how something changed. If something doesn't change, nothing changes. And for her, she changed everything. She walked away from a very lucrative career, not knowing what tomorrow was going to bring. What a powerful witness to an encounter with Jesus Christ. And I'm sure many of you sitting here right now can give a powerful witness. I'm not going to give you mine, but suffice it to say, I had my own reversion. We love a powerful conversion story. But here's what's missing that we really have to spend a little time with. Here's what's missing for many of us. Our understanding of God. Most of my life was probably a lot like yours. The relationships that I had were all of these exchange relationships, these quid pro quo kind of relationships. If you do this, I will love you. If you get this right, I will take care of you. If you, and fill in the blank, there's this whole sense that, well, I've got to spend my life earning your love. I mean, we priests see it sometimes. We have parishioners, believe it or not, there are parishioners with that little chip on their shoulder. When Father gets up to give the homily, especially, and you see them like this in the pew, they haven't even started and they're already timing me. If you don't inspire me, Father, I'm not coming back to church next week. This is not a quid pro quo kind of thing. I just was listening to a series that was done by Dr. Ed Shree, and he used a phrase that I had implicitly known, but he said it so much better than I could. When it comes to God, you can't earn his love. And yet we keep trying. We keep making Lent about earning God's favor. I'll do this to please God so that God will love me and God will take care of me. And Dr. Shree said, love is not earned, it is received. Love is not earned, it is received. The truth of love is, if I love you, I give myself totally to you. I'm willing to spend myself totally to you. But for that love to have any merit or meaning, you have to receive it from me and then give back yourself. Both sons in that parable had the same problem. Both had the exact same problem. Two different extremes, it may seem, the younger son, in his arrogance, in his arrogance, takes his property and leaves. But when he's coming back, he's rehearsing that line, I don't deserve to be called your son. Like, you can earn sonship? He can earn fatherhood? No, it is. And the father just gives to the son again. That, my dear brothers and sisters, is God. That is how much God loves. He gives himself to you whether you ask for it or not. That is his love so tremendous, so infinite. And all you have to do is receive it. You don't have to do anything to merit it. God's mercy is exactly the same. God's mercy, you just have to receive it. That's why I love being Catholic. I really do. It's so easy to receive God's mercy. Just go to confession. And he's ready to give it to you. There he is saying, you've done nothing to merit my love. You've done nothing to merit my mercy. But because of my son, here it is. It's yours. It's all yours. 
And just when I thought I had it figured out, he does it for me again and again and again. And how often, my dear brothers and sisters, we squander it. We act like the son who stayed home. We act like that son who really was having like a little hissy fit there. Oh, your son runs off with prostitutes and he gets a party and I've been slaving for you. I've earned a party. I've earned your love. I've slaved for you. And the father says, hey, you've always had whatever was mine. Take it. I don't care. I love you. Is that our experience of God, my dear brothers and sisters? Are we still trying to prove to him that we're worthy? Because I'll never be worthy on my own. Am I still trying to prove to him that I love him? Like St. Peter on the shore after the resurrection? You know I love you, O oh Lord. I can't do anything to merit his love. I can't do anything to warrant mercy. All I can do is receive what he's giving me, is to just be that vessel into which he can pour his grace, to be that person, if you will, like either of the sons, and approach the father and let the father be the father. So do you think you have it figured out? Do you think you have it all figured out? Because guess what? There are so many surprises for us, so many that God wants to give us. And as long as we open ourselves up and become that vessel, he's a God of surprises. He's the God that loves you. He's the God that will, I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you took everything. I don't care, just like everything I have is you. I don't care about that, I care about you. That's God speaking to you. There's something I'd like you to all do this week, and I think it's so important that you do it. Take today's gospel and every day for the next week, read it in a Lexio Divina kind of way. Read it once, read it twice, read it three times, but pausing in between each one. First, just looking at the dynamic of what's going on. Do, 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 do you pick a, I get emotional sometimes when I read the prodigal son story because it's filled with so much beauty. And it's filled with, read it, and then read it again, placing yourself into the story now as well identifying with one of the other brothers or identifying with the father. Then read it a third time and ask, how is this changing my life? And if you have to read it a fourth and a fifth time, go ahead. But read it again and again and again. Because my dear brothers and sisters, the richness of this parable could be wasted if we don't slow down a little bit. And like I said last week, if we don't make a change to our calendar and our schedule, Nothing is going to change. God is right there. We can rush up to him, and we can say to him, I no longer deserve to be called your son. And every time I say that, he laughs at me and says, you don't get it yet, do you? You don't do anything to discern, to deserve being my son. You are my son. You are his children. And you don't do anything to deserve that. He gave it to you because he loves you. And just when I thought I had it figured out, he does it to me again. And he throws this reading in front of me. And all my emotions well up again when I realize he loves me. And all I have to do is receive that love again. He wants to forgive me. All I have to do is receive that mercy again and again and again. Because he's not tired. I'm the one wearing myself out. God loves you. He wants you for himself. Receive his love today and stop trying to earn it. You can't. He gave it to you. It's a gift. Use it. God bless you.